Welcome to SmartOrg's webinar on Portfolio Management Evolution. With our panelists today, Yulia Resnick, the VP and Head of Global Specialty Portfolio at Teva Pharmaceuticals, and David Matheson, President and CEO of SmartOrg. My name is Stuart Creek, and I'll be in the background today helping facilitate. A little bit about SmartOrg before we start. Our portfolio evaluation platform builds your capability to align innovation and finance to overcome conflict and drive breakthrough growth. We found that one of the keys to driving breakthrough growth in organizations is to help innovation and finance agree on where to invest in new opportunities. And we've invented methods that help facilitate that. As we help you implement your solution, we're helping you build your ability to deliver evaluations that are credible and comparable so that you can make fair comparisons between opportunities that facilitate your team members accepting those decisions about your portfolio. This is the first in a webinar series that's going to bring insights into strategic portfolio management from some of our clients, from some of our executives, and from some of our industry friends. Our next webinar to be determined, we hope, by the end of May. Sean Williams, VP of R&D at Rogers Corporation, a manufacturer of engineered materials. Our agenda today is some introductory remarks by David. Then the presentation, we pre-recorded the presentation on video uh, because Yulia is in Israel and the logistics worked out better that way. She is here live, however, to answer your questions and so we'll have a brief intermission in the video presentation and also a question and answer period at the end where we'll uh, let David and Yulia take your questions. Please turn on your computer speakers during the video presentation. It only plays back through computer audio. So if you join the webinar by telephone, you'll need to turn on your computer speakers during the video. Enter your questions into the webinar questions box throughout the presentation. We will queue those up and make them available to David and Yulia at the breaks. And please do participate in the polls. We'll have three of them for you today. And to warm you up, let's get started with poll number one. What is your role in portfolio management? So tell us, are you a process owner accountable for making the process work? Are you a customer? who's accountable for business results using the process? Are you a participant or a supporter who basically provides input to the process, either information or judgment? Are you a consultant or a vendor who's an external provider? Or are you a curious bystander who's here only to learn about strategic portfolio management today? And I'll keep the voting open for a couple more seconds. Please do continue to vote. And we'll close the poll now. I'm going to bring up the results so we can take a look. It turns out that most of you today here are process owners who are accountable for making the process work and need to know how to do that. A um, number of people here today are consultants or vendors. And your external providers to people who are either process owners or customers. And quite a few of you are curious bystanders who are just interested in the topic today. But we do have a few customers and participants who either use or provide input to the process. That's an interesting mix of people today. And we'll use that to kind of end the presentation. So I'd like to uh, mention Yulia. And before David introduces her, I'll say that Yulia has had a long career at Teva in various roles. Um, she's currently the head of Global Specialty Portfolio. She was one of the people who was in bringing strategic portfolio management into Teva to manage a couple of major transitions that the company was going through, uh, which she will describe in the presentation. And um, she's been very directly involved in it from the get-go a few years ago. So David is the president and CEO of SmartWork, 
a co-founder of the company, uh, co-author of the book, The Foreign Organization, uh, instructor in Stanford University's Executive Education Program, someone who's worked with many companies over many years in a wide range of field uh, industries and applications in portfolio management. Hello, David. Hello, Stuart. Hello, everybody. Glad to be here and uh, delighted to be introducing um, Yulia and providing some basic background. I would like to uh, uh, start with a little survey I did at uh, my last uh, Stanford portfolio class on uh, basically how well a portfolio was designed to meet goals. Um, we asked some questions about the mix in portfolio, ran them against some benchmarks, and uh, had this kind of stunning result, which is a more or less 70% of portfolios are very unlikely to meet their growth goals. Uh, there's, you can see in this graph, which is the results of the survey, uh, the percentage of the percent participants is shown on the y-axis, and the probability of hitting the goal is on the x-axis. Um, and fully 44% of the participants um, have less than a 10% chance of their portfolio hitting their goal. There's a kind of denial that goes on, I think, in many companies that uh, somehow enough attention to project management is going to produce a result that's going to be able to drive breakthrough growth. Uh, there is a bunch of companies in the middle, more or less 30%. Um, and then there's about 20% of the companies that have greater than 90% chance of meeting their goal, which might sound good at first, but I think uh, also indicates perhaps um, uh, being a little too easy on themselves, uh, and they may be able to get more performance. So whether your portfolio can meet its goal or not, I don't know, but uh, I can report that many are kind of adequately, um, seriously underpowered, um, and uh, not not to, and are very likely to produce kind of mediocre results. Well, why why would that be? What are some of the common things that I see? Um, and let me start by um, telling you just a quick story. I was sitting in a tech company with their head of their portfolio process, like one of your portfolio owners, and he's describing the process to me. And he says, well, you know, our GMs decide what we're going to do, and then our job is to roll it all up. And the problem we have is engagement. Like, nobody cares that much about all our brilliant displays. Um, and I said, uh, well, and then he asked me, can you, can you take this data and make a brilliant graph that's going to drive decisions? And the answer was, well, no, actually. Uh, why not? Well, because you haven't designed your process to inform those challenging growth decisions. What you have is a roll-up for decisions already made. I would say this is one very significant issue many companies have, is that they don't use their portfolio process as a decision-making method. They use it more of a roll-up method or kind of a comparison method. Yeah, there's, quote, strategic decisions getting made. But the real action happens outside the process and elsewhere. And so these complex displays, the chance they're actually going to point you in the right direction, pretty low. Now, as a consequence, um, many portfolios um, look good and well-ordered, like the uh, duck with all her ducklings there on the left. And as soon as things get a little choppy, you kind of wonder what happened to the most important projects. As a sort of example with this, I'm sitting uh, with the CTO of a materials company. We're talking at the power about the portfolio, we had done a rigorous portfolio evaluation for the first time, and about half the products projects in his portfolio wouldn't move the needle for the company. And he says, wow, if this is right, then that means it doesn't matter whether these people succeed or fail, because it's not going to make any difference. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much the conclusion. And he thought, well, I'd be better off having these people invent new projects than working on these old projects that aren't going to do very much. Um, and so they had a lot, these projects had a lot of activity, they had a lot of energy, but at the end of the day, they were putting a lot of energy into stuff that wasn't matter and, in a way, starving some of the projects that really could make a big difference. So they weren't really focusing on the right things. Now, there's a very common reason for this, um, which is conflict. And good portfolio processes are also uh, conflict resolution processes. And again, people don't often think about this or design their projects, their processes to actually surface and put conflict at the center. Um, if you think about a portfolio process from a social point of view for a moment, um, the, the essence of it is saying no. How do you say no to a good project? That's going to 
creates some conflict. Um, and so you need to think about that and design your process in such a way that it can surface and come to uh, a good resolution of the conflict. Now, since we have, what, 40% uh, or so process owners, you're presumably well on your portfolio journey. Uh, there are others who uh, maybe are considering starting their journey um, or uh, would like to go to the next level or something like that, and I know it can look very formidable, um, a complicated, arduous journey. And I would uh, like to assure you that this is a great path to be on, and it's not nearly as frightening as it might seem. Um, and to get a little ahead of the story, one of Yulia's great insights is that the key to making a portfolio process thrive and grow is to keep it focused on the current business challenges. Everyone wants a portfolio process that's, quote, best practice. My experience is nobody does it because it's best practice. They do it to solve a real business problem. And, of course, when you go to solve a real business problem, you want to have a uh, a best practice kind of process, but that's not why you do it. So as a way of getting everyone to uh, think about their own <clears throat> situation a little bit and learn as much as possible from Yulia, let's do a quick poll <clears throat> on uh, some common business challenges and see what are your business challenges with uh, from your portfolio. So the poll is open. So we've got driving growth from your portfolio. This is a very common one in the example I kind of started with. Um, another common problem is the balance between innovation and incremental projects. And typically, companies have way too many incremental ones is a kind of a common problem. Um, <clears throat> managing conflict on where and how much to invest, just trying to get people to align on that decision. How do you drive the upside and find hidden opportunities? Uh, our portfolio must have something good in it. Let's make that happen. And uh, again, the last one here is cutting costs without destroying future growth. We need to pull something out. We don't want to damage stuff too much. Let's give the polls another couple seconds. And I think the voting has stabilized. So let's go ahead and show that poll. OK, so the top <clears throat> three here are driving growth, 36%. Focusing on innovative project and killing incremental ones, which is, in a way, a more specific version of driving growth. And cutting costs without destroying the future would be our top three here. These are very common problems. Um, and even though you may, not, you may have had one that wasn't on this list, so I invite you to just keep that in mind as we move into the story. And Yulia um, is going to tell her story here. So by way of introduction, uh, for Yulia, uh, I've sort of alluded to this, but I've worked with Yulia for many years at Teva Pharmaceutical. And one of the uh, really interesting things about Yulia's story is that it's been going for a long time through many twists and turns, from baby steps at the beginning to a pretty well-developed system. Um, and uh, this journey is, uh, I think, a great journey for anyone to, to learn about, whether you're at the beginning, in the middle, or uh, in a more mature place on that. So um, with that opening remarks, let me um, get this started. Thank you, David. Hello, everyone. First of all, I would start with short background about Teva, what Teva is about. Teva today is a company with the largest medicine cabinet in the world, which includes generic drugs, specialty drugs, and over-counter products, overall 1,800 molecules and 16,000 products. Just to make sure you are familiar with the difference between specialty and generic products, Specialty products are newly invented products, chemical or biological molecules, which treat different diseases or medical condition in a different way from what previously was known and from uh, the drugs existed before. And uh, these drugs usually have brand names as they are protected by patents. And once the patent for a specific drug expires, every company can produce the equivalent for this drug and this is what we call generic products. Uh, specialty products are usually owned by companies uh, who develop them. Once it be uh, the product becomes generic, every company uh, can make these products, and uh, you can see multiple versions of generic products on the market. The prices are usually very low, comparing to uh, the branded products. 
So back to Teva, today we are one of the top 10 pharmaceutical companies in the world. We are a leading generic company. Together with the generic products, we have a variety of specialty products and also OTC products, and we also produce active pharmaceutical ingredients. With the recent acquisition of Activis, Teva has presence in 80 markets, and we have 58,000 employees worldwide with 2015 revenues of almost $20 billion. A short history of Teva. Teva started as a small pharmaceutical wholesaler in Jerusalem at the beginning of 20th century. It achieved an extremely rapid growth through multiple mergers and acquisitions of more than 40 companies during the last 50 years. Uh, one of the important milestones in Teva history was acquisition of right focopaxone which is an innovative molecule for treatment of multiple sclerosis. And it was a very unusual step for generic company to acquire innovative or specialty molecule for the first time. It was a very complex molecule to develop with multiple regulatory challenges, which had to be developed by a company without any specific or very limited R&D capabilities in this area. So after a long development process, uh, the product was approved by FDA and launched in the U.S. in 1996 uh, together with Marion, which is known today as Aventis, in a partnership. And it took about 10 years before Copaxone um, became a billion-dollar product, and it reached its $1.1 billion revenue in uh, 2007. Another major milestone in development of the specialty side of our business was in 2011 when Teva acquired Cephalon, a company with a very significant presence on the specialty side of central neuropathic system area and uh, oncology, respiratory and pain. Together with Cephalon, Teva could provide leadership in these selected therapeutic areas. Last but not least, in 2014, Teva announced strategic focus on two core therapeutic areas, CNS and respiratory, and uh, this is another um, point in time where portfolio played significant role, and we will talk about it later. Talking about Copaxone and its major uh, portion in Teva revenue and even larger portion in uh, Teva profit, when we saw the revenues coming from Copaxone, it was clear that once product approaches loss of exclusivity, we need to find a way to compensate for it, which means that proper long-term planning is required. And in order to accomplish that, we need robust portfolio with sustainable growth expected from it, and it should be rightly balanced between risk and generate sustainable growth from uh, the entire business. We need also to manage the risk involved in the development of uh, specialty products we need to make sure that uh, we can address all these issues and this can be done through proper portfolio management uh, process. So today our specialty portfolio generates close to $8 billion revenue, while Copaxon continues to lead with around $4 billion annual sales. And even after we face generic competition in the U.S. with and uh, some novel therapies in this area, uh, it still continues to lead to be the leading drug in this area. In addition to Copaxone, Teva's portfolio includes therapies for sleep disorders like Nuvigil, Provigil, for Parkinson's disease with Azelect, and uh, some therapies for asthma and selected ther uh, therapies for oncology and women health area. In our development portfolio, we have more than uh, 30 different products, majority of them in CNS area and in respiratory therapeutic area, and this pipeline is expected to generate around 20 submissions during the uh, coming five to six years. And just to give a little bit of perspective about what does it take to prepare to the market and to launch a specialty product, some statistic about uh, development of specialty products on the market. It, it takes, in average, 10 years from the stage when the company identify a molecule uh, as a potential to be a drug until this molecule comes to the market and being approved. 
from 100 molecules starting the way in the development, only one will make it through the entire way to the market and will be launched. The average cost of this development is $2.6 billion, and of course, the statistics, uh, statistics is slightly different between different therapeutic areas and different between molecules if it's a molecule coming from biological nature of a chemical molecule, but in general, the risk is very high and the cost is very significant. So now, after a short background, some story about how do we develop specialty portfolio management in Teva, and some episodes about the way that this portfolio was developed. Initially, we started as a U.S. initiative. Think about what will be the next step after we lost exclusivity for Copaxon. In 2010, U.S. organization uh, started to, uh, portfolio planning to prepare the day after Copaxon. What are we going to do with the sales force? How do we want to continue uh, to manage our organization? Uh, how do we make sure that we can prepare ourselves to um, uh, the day when Copaxon will be much less significant comparing to what they had at that time? In 2011, this portfolio management became a process that we took to the global level, and specialty business initiated this process, uh, first of all, in order to improve resource allocation. In 2012, portfolio management became a major tool uh, that helped integrate between Teva and Cephalon as two different companies. And between 2013 uh, and 14, we also implemented some portfolio principle in order to measure value of the entire portfolio that we have in Teva and the products that we have in Teva. These days, between 2015 and 16, we actually took portfolio specialty to prioritization of the entire pipeline and also established a portfolio management as a global function. So the story begins in 2011. At that time, Teva had four different franchises, CNS, respiratory, biosimilar products, and women else, and we had around 60 development projects ongoing, widely spread over these four therapeutic areas or four franchises, and also uh, with some opportunistic area like human growth hormone and some additional products. Out of our uh, entire pipeline, we had 10 marketed products, one blockbuster with Copaxon, and total, um, the growth of Copaxon was still significant, uh, around 10% per year. Uh, so in 2010, the uh, overall sales of Copaxon uh, was uh, were $3.3 billion, and uh, specialty business created almost $5 billion revenue out of $16 billion for the entire company. So it was very significant business. And the major qu questions that we had at that time, how do we get visibility of resource allocation? How do we make sure that the resource allocation is transparent and we know where the money goes? And at that time, the business management of um, the specialty business asked a very simple question, which is probably too simplifying the portfolio management, but it's a uh, one of the issues that all of us are facing when we talk about portfolio, where do we put our money? If we put $10 million on a specific asset, what is this $10 million will create back? So at that time, R&D specialty spent was $616 million, which is a very significant amount, and the allocation of R&D resources were done on a case-by-case -case basis. No process to prioritize so to trade off with projects within different franchises. We didn't have any consistent way how we define the value coming from each program and uh, what is the value proposition of each program. And we also didn't have any ability to compare between the projects in different therapeutic areas. And uh, of course, we didn't have ability to compare between projects across the uh, therapeutic areas. In addition to that, business development opportunities were evaluated individually and not comparing to the existing uh, portfolio, so no context uh, around the business development opportunities was created. And as a result of that, we had to make sure that we develop a process which solve all these questions and issues. So uh, first of all, we had to focus on change management. These challenges in mind we had when we started our journey, and we realized very quickly that it's about change in mindset. 
because every one of the franchise managers, and at that time we had four franchises, were completely sure that they will end up uh, from this exercise with laws in R&D budget and with uh, deprioritizing of their assets. And uh, they were completely sure that there is no way to compare between the assets even in their own franchise, not talking about comparing the products between different franchises. For the first time, we had to address the issue of research allocation and consistency in assessment of, of our projects. And for the first time, business units leadership, or these four head of franchises, had to uh, face transparent process of comparing between the projects. We, as portfolio team, we experienced significant challenges as a result of cultural, cultural gaps and personal agendas. As mentioned, nobody believed that uh, they will end up this exercise with uh, prioritization of their assets in the way they see this, uh, this. The key for managing this and the key for success was Tron's executive commitment and experience parent support and also good software tools that can support and this transparency and support this exercise on on a, a more uh, operational basis. So what we developed was, first of all, the block of how do we do evaluation. We created three major blocks of inputs, major elements of output. So first of all, we talked about uh, how do we structure our development. We defined target product profile, we defined the phases of the development. Every phase of the development had assigned probability of success. And for every stage of the development, we defined the level of investment and the category of the investment and when these investments are happening and when these phases are happening. We also dealt with global deal structure. What is the structure of a specific licensing agreement for a specific product, royalties, milestones, when the expected approval is happening on different markets, what will be the size of the market, how do we estimate the size of the market in terms of population, what will be their picture and uh, how we reach this picture in terms of time, what will be the price for the product, and what are the operational cost and additional cost of this product. We also asked ourselves how the specific product will impact on the existing product if we expect any cannibalization of existing product as a result of new product coming to market, or we probably expect synergies in terms of sales and marketing activities. And all this were analyzed on the basis of different territories, Europe, US, Japan, and the rest of the world. In terms of output of this exercise, we uh, provided summary that are very uh, typical for a portfolio in terms of financial statements, in terms of uh, different analysis of tornado diagram, and uh, we did it both on the level of individual asset and on the level of uh, portfolio. So. It took us half a year uh, to come with the outcome of this project. And uh, um, as a result of this effort, the list of priority projects was created and agreed. An example of output that we used in order to demonstrate the result was, first of all, economic and uh, productivity or CFO chart, which demonstrated of uh, how the incremental investment will benefit and what will be the most beneficial incremental investment. And, um, for example, uh, one of the output of uh, this exercise was also innovation screen, where when you look at the view of innovation screen of specific franchise, you uh, can find that, for example, specific franchise has much more bread and butter products than uh, other one, but when you put everything together, the overall portfolio looks very balanced, and this was one of the very important moments uh, for these uh, four head of heads of franchises that uh, probably in every individual franchise, franchise you cannot create a very good balance of your portfolio, but when you put everything together, uh, it creates a much better picture and everyone can actually have uh, its own uh, piece in the budget and in the prioritization. 
Another benefit of uh, this exercise was actually adding value at product level by focusing on uh, uncertainties of very specific scenarios and on focusing on important elements of the scenario by looking at tornado diagram and this created very sufficient and very effective discussion about what is really important for individual product. So uh, on the one hand, it demonstrated that there are relatively uh, not too many elements in every product that can create difference. On the other hand, you can create very productive discussion about what really matters and not create discussion about uh, if you increase or decrease um, your assumption about uh, those elements that do not really make any difference. So, final stage of the project was um, executive management portfolio review, which created for the first time one standard way to measure the value of the products. It also enabled for the first time long-term view on potential and risk-adjusted adjusted financials, since every product can have probability of success or failure as there is a um, very important view that uh, we created as a result of this product of risk-adjusted and non-risk-adjusted financials. We also uh, created clear map of portfolio risk and value. Where is the risk? What are the products that can create very significant value but they are more risky probably and where their uh, bread and butter uh, products are located and also it created practical tool for decision making products both on the product level and on the level of entire portfolio is it's franchise or, or role for portfolio for specialty. Yulia, um, that's, uh, uh, we have a couple questions coming and this is David again before we continue on I thought it might be a good place for a little break uh, that's the first sort of episode in Yulia's story. Um, Yulia, we've got a, a couple questions. Um, one from Frank. Uh, he says, you talked about change management. How did you get people on board to really use the process and, and actually accept this and, and try it out? Maybe you'd like to respond to that. Thank you, David. Hi, everyone. Uh, so, uh, on an ongoing basis, uh, uh, portfolio process is, is actually uh, the process that we use at least on a uh, half a year basis. And uh, if uh, the portfolio process uh, provides a high priority to a couple of products, uh, then this uh, uh, prioritization guides uh, the managers on an ongoing basis about the resource allocation and this is a real tool for them in order to decide uh, where the budget goes uh, and where the um, human resources go. So uh, uh, this is a day-to-day -day implementation and uh, uh, on top of this uh, the portfolio process serves us uh, in order to decide about uh, um, opportunities uh, when they come uh, before decision making process and as a preparation for the decision making if we need to decide uh, to move forward with uh, one or another product to invest in the next stage or of the development of the product comparing for example to um, investment in new uh, business development opportunity then uh, the same tools that we used on portfolio level for the entire uh, portfolio we use also in order to compare and to put in the context uh, in the right context as uh, a specific decision about specific products which can be out of a uh, regular cycle of portfolio um, prioritization and uh, with specific decision about business development opportunity Great. Thank you. Um, another question is from Vladimir. He says, how was risk addressed? And I think he's thinking a little bit more of portfolio risk. So first of all, uh, we uh, assigned a specific risk, risk for every product. And uh, as you probably saw in the presentation, we had there uh, this uh, risk uh, value map and wanted to make sure that uh, when we decide uh, where to invest uh, more resources comparing to deprioritized couple of products, 
we wanted to make sure that we do not put our resources uh, on the most risky products and we balance them according also to the specific risk profile in a certain year that was required from the company. So for example, if uh, we knew that there are some very significant milestones coming in a specific uh, year uh, where we can uh, find ourselves with a couple of projects uh, not achieving the right results and not uh, being able to continue, then we probably uh, be more oriented to put money on higher risk products in the specific year because we believe that the additional resources, resources will be released as a result of negative results of uh, this or that product if we can use that the, uh, there is no significant milestones and the majority of the resources are already committed in the specific year then we would uh, definitely uh, uh, decrease the level of risk of the entire portfolio in order to not to find ourselves in a position that uh, we are committed to more money that we, than we can spend. Great. Thank you. Um, there was one other. Um, you may have answered this, but uh, uh, so you might have a very short, I think you kind of answered it, but Michael asked, how did you deal with low probability of success, high return projects versus high probability of success, low return projects. So it's kind of a more specific version. Um. So uh, it's uh, one of the criteria that we took into account because uh, we also had to look at the, uh, the realization or expected realization of the uh, revenues from these products in terms of uh, uh, timing. So uh, you, we need to make sure that the uh, entire portfolio is balanced. So if uh, the um, overall portfolio is creating sustainable growth on a risk-adjusted basis, uh, together with the, uh, low risk and high risk projects, low profitability, high profitability, uh, then we can uh, probably uh, put our uh, resources also on both sides. If we see that our profitability is uh, questionable, for, for example, five years from now, then uh, we will prioritize higher uh, low-risk projects and put more projects with low risk that can generate uh, revenues in five years from now in order to close the gap. So it's not only our um, probability of success versus expected revenues, it's also about timing of this revenue realization. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, I would invite everybody to keep typing in questions, and we'll queue them up for a more extended Q&A session at the end. Um, before we proceed, I want to invite everybody to think about their business challenge. And let's do a quick poll. Yulia has shown several things that she did that were pretty effective. Um, so let's do a poll on this. So of the things she's talked about, we picked a few that are common, and, and which ones might might be helpful to you in the context of what you're working on. So incorporating uncertainty and in scenarios, she showed the tornado chart. Um, she set up her blocks in her model to get consistency, transparent, and standardized evaluation. She uh, started by changing the management, uh, she ch changing the management focus to identifying the most valuable projects instead of just doing my projects. Um, comparing investment productivity, really stacking them all up on a kind of financial return basis. She showed something called the CFO chart or understanding the balance of project types. This is the risk return. She showed an example called the innovation screen. So uh, we'll close the polls in a moment. I see people are still voting on this. And uh, there's still a few more votes coming in. And I think that's probably good enough if we could close the poll and we'll display the results. And you can see that uh, the top one there is changing management focus to the most valuable projects um, and followed closely by incorporating uncertainty in scenarios like the tornado chart and understanding the balance of project types, the innovation screens. Uh, Yula, you, you care to comment? Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, so first of all, I, I completely agree that uh, one of the major drivers uh, uh, that uh, we can identify when implementing uh, portfolio management is uh, uh, managing management mindset. So we're focused on the uh, most valuable projects and uh, uh, leave alone uh, the uh, things that uh, don't really matter. 
and uh, uh, about incorporating uncertainty and scenarios, um, I think that the most critical part here will be consistency. So uh, uh, before you look at the um, uncertainties and scenarios and you combine a couple of products together into one por portfolio, you need to make sure that you have a very consistent approach uh, to um, assess uncertainty and uh, you are comparing apples to apples. Uh, I think this is the most critical thing because otherwise uh, your result will be not really valuable. Great. Thank you. Well, let's uh, return to the second part. Yulia has talked about her sort of first uh, run at the uh, portfolio process, and now she's going to talk more about the evolution of it. Close to this time uh, when we completed this exercise of her uh, first portfolio um, look, Teva, uh, completed, Teva announced acquisition of Cephalon, which was a very significant acquisition in specialty area. And uh, this deal changed significantly the entire landscape of a specialty business, bringing a new therapeutic area and areas and new products. So usually when Teva acquires company, we estimate potential synergies as a part of the deal evaluation. And in this case, we estimated the synergies as half a billion dollar in cost and this should be implemented uh, into the integration of the two pro uh, companies and uh, usually all the mer measures and acquisitions take time until they are approved because of antitrust authorities and um, uh, this product uh, this process takes a couple of months uh, in major countries where this acquisition is becoming effective until this acquisition is approved, both companies still continue to manage themselves as competitors and there is no sharing of competitive information between the companies. So under these circumstances, we had to prepare a day one review. Day one was supposed to happen once there is approval of the deal by antitrust. And at that time, if you want to be uh, effective, you need to make good decision about what to continue to keep in your uh, portfolio and uh, which products you need to abandon in order to enable these synergies to happen. So uh, we had limitation about sharing confidential information. On the other hand, we couldn't allow ourselves to wait because we had to make decisions quickly. We knew that combined R&D budget for two companies will be much lower than the sum of R&D budgets of two companies uh, that we um, faced before acquisition. And time was money because once uh, we do not real, uh, realize the synergies, uh, we lose this half a billion dollar estimation that we prepared and we need to make our decisions very, very quickly. So. The recently completed portfolio management project was used as a platform for this day one review. And we created uh, guidance and templates uh, that we distributed to the two companies to enable comprehensive and consistent review of the products coming from two different companies. And uh, we used the same templates and the same blocks that we developed in order to prepare our own pre-acquisition portfolio review in order to make sure that all the products are being reviewed consistently once confidential information can be shared and once acquisition approved. So following the acquisition, we almost doubled our portfolio. From four franchises, we had six franchises, six different therapeutic areas. From 60 products, we have uh, more than 100 products. And the, uh, the methodology we developed previously was actually the one that we used this time just for more complex portfolio. And uh, the original knowledge about every product was very different between two companies. So post acquisition, uh, we were able to put together all this information and review the portfolio. However, the minute after acquisition was approved, the majority of the executive management that previously led specialty business was replaced by Cephalon executive. And those people who endorsed portfolio process previously 
directly and those people who mm, worked with us and uh, we actually worked with them very hard in order to convince them that this is a very important process and we brought them together to review the portfolio. Uh, we are replaced by different executive management and this created lack, on, lack of consistency and continuity on the process. However, we found out that this portfolio review that was based on a very comprehensive and consistent methodology was used actually as anchor in consistent review of portfolio structure, R&D uh, priorities, and uh, we leveraged this process in order to create prioritization of projects. We created three categories uh, of this prioritization, uh, high priority, regular priority, and low priority. And it was created based on many financial criteria, but also based on the risk. And um, as a result of these categories and uh, these decisions, we were able to focus our investment on more effective and more valuable products. In this year, the total R&D spent was close to $800 million, so the most significant amount of resources were, uh, have to be prioritized. In 2013 and 14, this is the next milestone that is important in the life of portfolio management, we decided to take uh, the methodology to the company level. So uh, when we looked at specialty and generic business together, we found out that there were many approaches for portfolio evaluation. Uh, there were many different approaches that you cannot compare it to each other. We had also different planning and forecasting units with different requirements, uh, not only between specialty, generic, and OTC, but also between geographies, because not uh, all the global units had the same forecasting and pl planning units. We also had different evaluation needs and different evaluations uh, methods in terms of different level of details, different treatment of uncertainties, and also comparability in, uh, between uh, different forecasts. In addition to that, uh, there were a variety of systems in place for evaluation. So uh, one of the units used uh, simple Excel, Monte Carlo models, and other units used some systems for, uh, for this, and everyone work, worked differently. And uh, we also uh, used different assumptions and different uh, way of doing this forecast. So all the results were very inconsistent, and if we took everything on a company level, we didn't find any way to compare evaluations and to create one global view. So uh, we initiated Value for Teva project, which was led by corporate finance, and we gathered the practices across the organization in order to understand how today, uh, how that day teams worked and what will be our recommendation to make it uh, more comparable. We agreed on list of metrics and uh, we uh, agreed on how do we want to measure our products and the portfolio. However, it, uh, because the different nature of the businesses, specialty versus generic and OTC, it was still very difficult to create comprehensive portfolio process on the company level and even harder to, comp to design and to implement it. In parallel with this development of Value for Teva methodology, we also changed the planning cycle of the uh, company. Instead of previously existed three years work plan process, we created two separate processes, long range plan for five to 10 years horizon and annual operating plan and, uh, focusing on the coming year. And uh, the outcome of the project was a grid standard analysis and metrics. So it's, um, first of all, project analysis and portfolio metrics related to commercial value and productivity. And also the same view that uh, I referred to as a part of a portfolio process we developed initially in specialty business was used in order to and put the metrics and put the criteria for the entire process of the entire company and uh, as a way to look at their portfolio reports and uh, cumulative value of our portfolio. 
and the next one is portfolio prioritization process, which we uh, initiated in 2015. As the business situation was, again, back to specialty business, Compaxon continues to be leading product with $4 billion revenues in uh, 2015, but we still uh, face uncertainty around exclusivity that uh, we uh, started to talk about it even in 2010. We had additional products and we still have additional products coming to end of life cycle like Trianda and uh, as a result of that we expect additional loss of revenue and current pipeline is not necessarily sufficient to cover the existing gap. On top of this our resources are still limited so uh, in 2015 we spent uh, less than one billion dollar for the specialty R&D which is very uh, limited comparing to the pipelines that we wanted to develop. As a result of uh, the existing business situation, we first of all took uh, value for Teva outcome. Uh, how do we measure products and uh, value and how do we measure our portfolio? And emphasize our portfolio approach uh, in order to continue building of specialty portfolio and optimize R&D resources. So um, our portfolio prioritization was resulting in very strong decision. We had full organizational alignment which this time was relatively easy to achieve uh, in terms of needs and objectives and in terms of implementation of the decision. For example, we decided that out of um, all the products that we have in uh, the prioritization, the low priority products will be terminated and we created three major buckets, uh, very similar to what we originally uh, did a couple of years back. Category A with high priority project where we want to put all the necessary resources in order to accelerate development and to decrease the risk uh, in order to make sure that this product make it happen and it also uh, means that these products will uh, have very high attention in terms of senior management prioritization. Category B, it's a majority of the products, a regular, a regular priority in terms of resource allocation. And category C, this is low priority project uh, considered for termination or other funding mechanism like funding by partnership. And uh, if we want to finance these projects, they are dependent on, on release of budgets during the year. And as mentioned before, we also terminated part of this low priority project. And now we are facing the next challenge, which is taking the portfolio management to the next level from portfolio prioritization to global portfolio function, which starts with strategy uh, where you need to identify what is your objectives, what are your financial objectives, and what are your objectives in terms of therapeutic area, where do you want to play? Out of this strategy, we create pipeline and we prioritize pipeline based on the strategy objectives. And we also op optimize and rationalize existing portfolio in terms of products coming to end of life, when do we want to terminate them, and when do we want to continue to improve and to optimize the existing portfolio. All these have uh, operational implementation, R&D, regional sales and marketing efforts, country sales and marketing efforts, operational implications in terms of production, legal, regulatory, etc. And once you implement all your priorities and you implement your decisions about prioritization and optimization of the portfolio, this creates value for the portfolio and this creates value for the products, which we need to make sure that we are, know how to measure and also how to communicate and uh, learn from this back to the strategy and to re uh, review and refresh our strategy based on what we currently, uh, how we currently performing. So for the summary, some takeaway messages and some takeaway sorts. Uh, sorts. Portfolio is a culture and it takes time to develop, to communicate and to integrate it into the uh, culture of the organization and it's not a simple culture to implement and to develop. But if you do it right, it becomes the spinal cord of your organization and control multiple functions of this organization as a spinal cord controls the functions of the body. 
portfolio management is also a journey. It has many ups and downs and it has many challenges and it requires persistence and patience. What is really important is keep focus on contributing to the underlying business problem. It's very easy to take a portfolio management to very technical and operational level, but portfolio management has its rights to exist only if it consistently creates value. Easy is by quicker decision making and better quality of the decision. Easy is by creating balanced portfolio which is aligned with company strategy and we can demonstrate how it's aligned with company strategy. Its value should be clearly communicated and after it's measured in the right and appropriate way. And it's also organizational to focus on most valuable product in terms of resource allocation and in terms of organizational attention. So thank you for listening and goodbye. That was great. Thank you, Julia. Um, we want to turn to Q&A. There are a number uh, queued up here. Uh, but we're approaching the top of the hour, so I thought I'd just make a few administrative um, remarks and then we'll move to Q&A uh, for as long as people remain interested. So please keep your questions coming. Um, in terms of uh, following up, uh, if you have questions that don't get addressed now, please email Stuart Creek. You can see his email and he'll uh, deal with the easy ones and pass them on to you and I as, a, as appropriate. We do have another webinar coming up probably towards the end of the May. Uh, from uh, Rogers Corporation. It's very different than pharma. It's a, uh, a materials company, and they're dealing with driving the next generation of growth by looking at the, some of the more early stage projects and considering them in conjunction with their more incremental current projects. And then uh, lastly, visit smarter.com to learn more about portfolio management. So that's my uh, administrative comments. Um, let's go to the Q&A, and I've uh, got several good ones here. Um, two, maybe these are related, so I'll ask you two questions at once, Yulia, and you can parse them apart. So Sri wants to know, how did you get executive alignment? And Joseph asks, how did you deal with executives who wanted to protect their domains? Uh, and then he gives a variety of reasons like fear, power change, and so on. So how do you get executive alignment? How do you deal with people wanting to protect their domains? What are your thoughts? So first of all, thank you for this question because this is a, a very uh, critical issue in uh, the entire approach to the portfolio management. And um, in our um, case, it was uh, uh, very difficult to start with uh, because the entire portfolio management concept was something that uh, our executive managers were absolutely not familiar with. So it, it takes, first of all, a lot of theoretical education. So you need to uh, explain people what portfolio management means and what are the benefits of portfolio management in general before you start with uh, your very specific examples and before you approach uh, uh, your specific products and uh, projects to prioritize. And then um, I think that, uh, first of all, we had the... Uh, a very uh, experienced uh, support uh, from David and his company uh, and you need to have some external view at least for the first time when you started because uh, this way you uh, make sure or you convince people that the approach is absolutely objective without any political agendas and uh, the next stage for us uh, was actually to bring uh, the executives to um, more transparency about the businesses that are, uh, compare for the same resources. So before we started the portfolio management process, every uh, business unit manager was very much focused on uh, his or her own projects and products. And he actually didn't have any visibility on um, other business units uh, uh, when they are competing for the same resources. And once you bring them to understanding that sometimes you lose one, you or sometimes you win one, uh, they uh, will not be happy about the decisions if you decide to deprioritize uh, their projects, but they will definitely understand the rationale and they will be definitely aligned with the way that the decision was made. So I think that transparency and uh, understanding uh, that um, 
you can't win all the time and uh, if you understand the uh, rational behind the decision and you agree with it then you actually uh, have a, a fair decision making process and uh, a executive manager will finally be, be aligned with it as well. Great, thank you. Um, I have another one from Henry. I, I think Henry might want some courage. He says, what was it like for you to experience the ups and downs of this journey? Hmm. Uh, it's a good question. Uh, and um, I think that uh, ups are, uh, are usually very easy uh, and uh, great to uh, um, see and to uh, be part of this uh, success when you bring uh, the organization uh, to decide uh, the, the decision based on the process that you are uh, leading. Uh, and uh, uh, when you are experience uh, the downside of this process or lack of alignment, um, I think that the most important part is to stick to the facts. And uh, sometimes uh, by uh, bringing the facts and bringing the right information, you can um, survive much better this downs uh, comparing to uh, the situation when you are um, bringing yourself to be uh, uh, this or that side of uh, uh, all the political issues that usually uh, those that are driving these downs on the portfolio management. Great, thank you. I have a question here from uh, Jorge. Um, how did you get people, I think meaning here the non-executives, the involved or the committed, uh, or the, the employees or the involved, committed to the solutions? How were non-executives involved and the people who really are subject to these decisions? So we uh, found out that uh, portfolio decisions and portfolio management is not something that you can uh, communicate or you want to communicate and to explain to the entire company until the uh, lowest level of the organization. Uh, probably mid-management, that it uh, very much depends on the size of the organization, is there uh, those who are supposed to be uh, exposed to, uh, to the process. And um, if this mid-management is uh, in uh, alignment with the process, understands uh, the process, uh, then they can easily uh, manage uh, the people. But uh, uh, in any case, um, we communicated the priorities uh, to the entire organization. We communicated that uh, the process was transparent, the process included all the relevant stakeholders, but we didn't uh, go to the details uh, into the details of the process with the entire organization. We didn't find it helpful. Great, thank you. Um, Vladimir is asking how you dealt with resource allocation throughout this, or how was this related to your resource management processes? Might be another way of saying it. So we're, uh, we mainly uh, manage the resource allocation uh, based on the priorities defined by the portfolio process. And it means that uh, we didn't go into very uh, detailed level of resource allocation uh, because it's uh, more mathematical and uh, uh, more detailed exercise which is not necessary um, beneficial in terms of uh, uh, high level of the organization and defining the priorities. And in a uh, um, certain level, we actually uh, relied on uh, the people uh, and the, uh, this mid-management level that if you uh, have your re uh, priorities, you actually uh, understand where to put your resources on an ongoing basis. And in any case, um, the portfolio process was the one that uh, actually we uh, used in order to drive the resource allocation for the long-range planning and define the, uh, where do we put uh, the money with different scenarios. Great. Thank you. Um, I think that's all the questions people have submitted. Just taking a quick look at them here. Uh, so maybe just... Uh, any concluding remarks or, or final words you want to say, Yulia? 
Uh, thank you for uh, participating. And uh, if you have any additional questions, I'm happy to uh, address and uh, to support where needed. Yeah, thank you. So I want to say one concluding remark. I've seen a lot of portfolio management processes. And just to kind of underline, Yulia has been through quite a long journey. And I think there is a journey. And I, I take a lot of heart and courage from her success. And, and one thing I really learned um, by working with her is just the importance of relentlessly focusing on the actual business problem at the time. And I think that has really contributed to your staying power and your ongoing success through what are actually tectonic shifts in your organization. I mean, it's uh, a lot of times things get blown up when you get the kind of changes you're dealing with. And somehow you've managed to work your way through all of that. So I think that's my the real thing I've learned from you. So I've really appreciated the opportunity to work with you. And um, thank everybody for joining. All right, we'll thank sign you. off. Yep, go ahead, Julia. Thank you. No. Thank you. All right, we'll sign off. Thanks, everybody, for joining. <laughs>